Welcome everyone to our first session of the Niche to Success System. This is all new for 2016 and you may be watching this on the recording so it might not even be 2016 anymore. Um, but this is the system that I use, that I teach and that has built some pretty darn successful e-commerce businesses. Now, what I will not be teaching is how to put up a listing, how to take pictures, how to sell on Amazon. Um, we're not gonna get into those types of things on this. That is what the regular Appsters uh, group, the Niche to, to Profit Academy is for. This is truly an advanced course for those who are ready to start doing what everybody else is not doing. Um, and one of the reasons I developed this is because I am not a fan of Amazon. I truly believe that those who are building these big, huge revenue driving businesses on Amazon are gonna be in for some pretty hard times at some point when Amazon just really starts crunching the rules, upping the fees, doing all these things that just make it like you could go get a job. Um, granted, you can make a lot of money over there and a lot of people are right now. So I'm, I'm not discounting that, it's a revenue stream. I use it myself. But I want you to have your own business, your own brand, your own stuff to fall back on so it doesn't matter what eBay or Amazon do in the future you are in control of your own business. That is what I'm all about. That is, that's what I preach out there, is you can be safe from whatever big corporate does by developing and building your brand. And, and the time now is better than it has ever been because you can use eBay to grab those customers. And by the way, eBay knows I teach you this stuff. And I just got confirmation again the other night that this is A-OK. -okay. They are perfectly fine with you harvesting a customer that you did business with and following up and marketing to them outside of eBay once that transaction's over. So it's not against the rules. eBay knows you're doing it and they are fine with it. Um, so that's what I'm gonna be teaching you is how do you build that customer base? How do you plan for the slow seasons? How do you make sure that you have the revenue that you want and need? And how do you grow that business from year to year? Because that's important too. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm really, I don't like the model of retail arbitrage. To me, that's boring. I am not a retail shopper to begin with. So going in those stores is, but <laughs> I am I'm a I, I either shop online for those things that I need or you know the grocery store is about all I go to but everything else I buy online thrift stores yard sales I'm very frugal that way that's kind of how I got into this whole thing um, and I've also discovered that 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 the margins are just not there for me I like big margins I like buy it for a dollar and sell it for fifty buy it for $10, sell it for 100 I've been doing those margins now for 19 years. Um, and there's plenty of stuff out there that you can still do that. Okay, let's get started. Um, all right, I will, I will change that slide now so you can see something different. This is one of my favorite quotes. And remember, as I said, in the um, Find Sell Profit webinar I did uh, when I introduced this course was that you are a business owner. You need to throw away the self-employed title. Keep that for the IRS. They're still going to call you that. But you need to have the mindset of a business owner. It, it, and it really is an important mind shift. If you're still considering yourself self-employed, that makes you an employee. That's no fun. So you're a business owner. All right, now, I'd rather attempt to do something great and fail than to attempt to do nothing and succeed. And too many times I see people who are afraid 
to take those steps. They're afraid to try something new or, or do something different in their business. And I want to really encourage you with this quote that failure is not a bad thing. Failure is just learning. Oh, my failures, you guys, <laughs> I have a whole stream of them behind me. But that's okay because each one has taught me something different and then it's led to a success somewhere. And, um, you know, you've, you've probably heard me tell the story about going door to door selling these carpet cleaners for Electric Lux. And we had to go knock on complete strangers' doors and we gave them a demo. There was two of us. We'd pair up and we'd go out. And, and the way it worked was we would offer to clean a room of their house. We'd clean their carpet and do this demo. And all while we're doing that, we're trying to sell them this system. And I was such a good salesperson at that that I sold one to myself. <laughs> Yeah, that, that whole sales thing just was never for me. I'm not a salesperson, but yet I'm a salesperson. So that was one of the things that taught me early on that I had to find a different way to sell stuff because I loved retail and resale. So it wasn't about just a sales pitch at that point. And that's kind of where my marketing and branding history starts. And that was about Oh my goodness, I was like 20 something. Uh, so that was, let's just say that was some time ago. <laughs> um, so I have spent my whole life studying and developing and watching marketing change as the internet internet came on uh, online and, and really changed the way we did things. Um, and, and it's powerful now and it's, and it's crazy how much we can do out there. So that is what we're going to work on. So first, I want you to remember that every big business started with just an idea. And I just want to get a gauge of where everybody's at. So who, and maybe you don't want to raise your hands, you can answer silently, but I would love to know because there's no shame in these answers, okay? Who has an idea a business idea that they have been hiding because they think it will be seen as stupid. They think it won't work. Think they'll get laughed at. You have an idea for your own business, but you haven't done it because you thought that it would just fall flat. Anybody willing to confess? Okay, a couple of you. So I have... I have, I ask my husband, I have about an idea a night. <laughs> so here's the thing, who's willing to work on one of those ideas and see what takes hold? Cool. All right. Yay. So that's the most important thing, you guys, is those ideas, those sparks that you have, entertain them, grow them, put them on paper. Toss them around because they can be the things that develop into your big thing. So who here is interested in growing their business to, let's say, a million-dollar business? And if you're not, that's okay. Remember, this is, this is not about judgment. As I talked about, it's about where you picture success. But if you want to get there, I want to help you get there. Million is scary. Ooh, we'll talk about that. Okay, several of you want that million dollar business. Cool. I personally do. I've got a plan in place right now. Um, I've got three years. It's my three year goal is to be at a million plus. Million plus. You want a two million. Perfect. Okay, great. So let me introduce you to a few business owners you may have heard about and I want to encourage you because these people started from nothing okay this one you might recognize anybody anybody recognize that little logo there some of you may have one of those cups in front of you as we speak <laughs> so um, the story behind Starbucks 
is uh, it was originally two teachers and a writer got together and they started up the Seattle Coffee Bean Company in 1971. But we didn't really know about them then. Uh, they were just tootling along, doing a business, maybe kind of like you are right now in your business, right? Doing okay, being business owners. So um, they brought in this little fella named Howard Schultz. He joined the company in 1982, and and he had this huge idea for these Starbucks coffee shops. Now, the original guys, they were hesitant. They didn't want to change their business plan because they were, they were going along in their comfort zone. And he had a pretty drastic change to the plan. But they went ahead and trusted him, and they went for it. And the rest is kind of history because they, now they grew the company to uh, – it went public in 1992, and it grew into the largest chain of coffee houses in the world. There's 17,000 stores spread across 55 countries, and it pretty much feels like you can find one on every street corner, right? So here's what's interesting about Howard Schultz. Uh, he did an interview with a British tabloid named The Mirror, and this was a quote from him. He says, growing up, I always felt like I was living on the other side of the tracks. I knew the people on the other side had more resources, more money, happier families, and for some reason, I don't know why or how, I wanted to climb over that fence and achieve something beyond what people were saying was possible. I may have a suit and tie on now, but I know where I'm from and I know what it's like. So this, this guy just had an idea, and he partnered with the guys who had the engine to run his idea from. Um, so there's one. Here's another one. Um, this is a company that was founded by Fred DeLuca with a mere $1,000, which he borrowed from a friend. And that friend became his partner. That was Peter Buck. And the original goal that they had for this was just to open 32 stores in the first 10 years. And they got to the nine-year mark and realized that they were going to come up short. So then they decided to franchise. And so they took this idea and created a franchise that now has more locations worldwide than McDonald's. They have more than 34,000 locations in 98 countries. And the company hauled in like $15.2 in revenue. And, and that was back in 2010. Um, and they never went public. It's still a privately held and, and owned company between DeLuca and um, Buck's company, which is Doctors Associates. So that's a pretty cool story. Started with just a borrowed $1,000. Here's another one you might recognize. Um, I actually just found out this history about Mattel. Now, it, you guys know Mattel is just like, it, it's, synonymous with with toys like, like you know it's a no-brainer right so uh, it was founded by a couple named Ruth and Elliot Handler and they were actually picture frame makers and they made these picture frames out of their house and sold them and what they did was took the leftover wooden scraps from their frames and started building doll houses so they took that idea and they thought, oh, let's just, let's do this. And again, the rest is kind of history. They, they designed a toy called a Yuka Doodle musical toy. That was in 1947. And from there, they just kept coming up with these ideas for toys, grew the company into a $5 million venture by the mid-1950s. And then Ruth came up with this idea for this doll that could have different dresses and shoes and purses. And you guys know what doll I'm talking about? Let's see if you're still listening to me. <laughs> yes, the Barbie doll. The Barbie doll actually changed the toy industry forever. 
uh, Mattel is now the world's largest toy company based on revenue, which in 2010 was 5.9 billion. Billion! And so when you say the million sounds scary, the billion sounds scary, I want to assure you guys that with the right idea and building it up, this is not all something you have to run yourself. See, that to me is the dream of it all. If you're a one-man show right now, or maybe you just have a couple of employees, or, or you know, you're a husband and wife team, or whatever you're doing, it's a lot of work, right? The more you grow, the more you're able to add on pieces and teams and stop doing pieces of the work, especially the stuff you don't like to do. And with the right idea, you can sit back and be the CEO that just oversees things. See, that's my dream. That's, that's where I'm going. It's I'm going to build it up, and then I am going to have good managers in place and team, and I am just going to be the CEO. It really, really is possible, you guys. It's really possible. It doesn't have to be a dream. That's the cool thing. Okay, let me share one more with you. Ralph Lauren, he graduated from high school in the Bronx, New York, and then later he dropped out of college to join the Army. And he was working as a clerk at Brooks Brothers, and Brooks Brothers, the men's clothing store. And he started questioning whether men were ready for wider and brighter designs in ties. So he had a different idea for ties. Ties were already invented. Ties were already being sold. He just came up with a new idea. So the year he decided to make his dream a reality in 1967, he sold $500,000 worth of ties. Now that's 1967. That's, that's a lot more than what 500000 is worth today. Um, so he started Polo, we know Ralph Lauren Polo, the next year. He is now worth $7.7 .7 billion. Actually, that was as of three years ago. $7.7 .7 billion. Do you think he's doing all the work in his company? Heck no. <laughs> nope. But you know what? He's doing the parts he loves to do, I bet. Because if he loves to come up with ideas for new ties or new lines of product, that's what he's doing. He gets to do just the fun parts, just what he loves to do. So what do you think that every single one of these business owners had in common? And I talked a little bit about this already driving a dream, they had an idea, but is it enough to just have a drive and a dream and idea? Ah, there we go. They took a risk. They took a risk. And risk is scary. Like, it kind of goes against our, our mental grain to take risks. We have a survival instinct to stay safe and stay in our little comfort area. So risk is scary. Uh, and many, 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 many people won't do it. That is why not everybody signed up for this workshop. That is why not everybody has a million dollar uh, Amazon business even, even though you know it's possible, there's risks involved. So you have to be willing to take risks. That is what every single billionaire has in common. Find me one that that is not the, the common piece and, um, uh, I'll eat my words because <laughs> I don't think you will find it. So they have an idea, they have a dream, but the thing is they actually went for it. They were willing to fall on their face. And as you can see, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money. It doesn't. So you may not aspire to be a billionaire, and that's okay, but I do want you to have a dream. I want you to have something that you're working for. Otherwise, it is way, 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 way too easy to stay in your cozy comfort zone, okay? So money is great. I mean, it, but as you know, money does not buy happiness. Money can be actually very stressful if you don't know what to do with it, right? We see this all the time with celebrities or people that come into money and they're very unhappy. So money isn't about what you can buy. It's about what you can do with it for your life, if that makes sense to everybody. So you really need to know what that is before you go 
chasing the big money. You want to be sure that you're ready and you know what to do with it when it comes. You notice I said when it comes. Because one of the things that happens is when you have this in place, you're more motivated to do what it takes, and it's much, much more easy to reach your goal. Um, one of the first workshops I did in the Appsters was one where, I believe this was in the Six Figure Club, we created vision boards. And I can tell you, now looking back on that year, and this was about three years ago, just about everybody managed to complete what was on their vision board because it really does do something in your brain. Um, you guys want to hear what mine is right now? I don't want to bore you if you don't want to hear it, but I, I am happy to share with you what my current aspiration is that I'm going to do with my money when I make it. Okay, good. So um, mine is to have a large custom home. I know right where it's going to be located. It's going to be on the, the um, I guess you call it the western side of Vegas. There's an area there that in the 70s was where all of the rich people lived. So there's these really nice custom homes. They're not those cookie cutter, you know, done by the builder homes. And they're on large pieces of property. So I want one of those that's at least an acre. I want to have horses and farm animals again so that my kids and grandkids can experience animals and taking care of them and, and that part of life that I used to have. I want a heated indoor pool, but I want it to be in a room where the roof opens up and it can be outdoors if I want it to be. I want a big, beautiful kitchen with a huge refrigerator freezer because I hate to go grocery shopping, so I want to be able to freeze a lot of stuff. <laughs> and then I want a big center island for preparing the food. But I also want a personal chef to be able to come over once or twice a week to put some dishes in that freezer for me that I just need to heat up. I want a housekeeper. I want to not have to worry about when the bills are due and if there's enough money in the bank to pay them. I, I currently, I have a Cadillac Escalade, but it's an older one. I want a newer one with more of the bells and whistles and, and all that cool stuff. But the thing is, I want it paid for. I don't want a car payment. And hubby wants his Mercedes. He had one, and we sold it. Uh, he wants it back. I put him in a, in a Ford Fusion. Is that really bad of me? <laughs> I didn't let him get in a gas guzzler. <laughs> So, yeah, I know. I have to make that up to him. Um, I want to be able to travel in an RV that, again, is paid for all over the country, going to auctions, flea markets, without the restraint of a budget. And I really, I want a business that I can leave to my kids and their kids to run as long as they want. So I've had this in place for about, a little over six months, maybe about nine months, this has been the vision I came up with. And I, and I gave it all those details because I want you to give your vision all those details. Because the more detailed it is, the more real it is in your brain, and the more you're going to make it happen. Okay? So I am going to ask you to be willing to take some risks as we go along. There's going to be some things that will feel very uncomfortable. Um, I'm not going to do anything to jeopardize reputations or put you out there in a way that is going to do harm to your business, okay? So does everybody trust me with that? Is there anybody who admit they don't trust me? <laughs> okay, good. Phew. <laughs> so trust me, you guys. I absolutely have your best interests in mind. and. I, this is my wheelhouse. This is what I'm really good at. I have been working with some fairly large businesses outside of eBay and outside of the online world and, and helping with uh, branding and marketing and, and improving their businesses. So this is not just something I decided, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to teach people this. This has been my life. And I want to share that with you. So, but you're going to need to be in this with me because you got to do the work, all right? Uh, the cool thing is you are not alone. We have the Facebook group. I want you guys to use that. 
Um, if you are thinking about putting something out there on your page or developing a, a brand message or even colors, logos, that kind of thing, post it. Get advice, get feedback, and get help with the parts that you're struggling with if you get stuck. All right, that's what this workshop is all. That's why I call it a workshop because it isn't just a bunch of courses that you're going to watch on a video and or hear live and, okay, go do it and that's it. No, this is, we're doing this together, okay? Um, and sadly, I have to tell you this, 20% of the people who signed up for this will be the ones that actually do the work and put all the steps in place. So let me just ask right now, will you be one of those 20% or are you going to be in the 80% that gives up? Good. I have a big 20%. I'm going to hold you to that. So that's one of the things I'm going to do through this as well is accountability. Uh, I am going to push you a little bit. I am going to challenge you a little bit. And I'm also going to hold you accountable. If you say you're going to do something, I'm going to be right there being the nag that says, um, you said you were going to do this, okay? Uh, so you know me. I, I do it gently and with the utmost love. Um, but that's really what some of us need. I need that. I have people that do that for me because I have a tendency to get off course and I need to be kept straight. And that's what I'm going to do for you guys as well. And I didn't try to do this alone. I brought in mentors into the Facebook group that you can reach out to as well through this. So uh, lots of stuff going over in the Facebook group that which you really need to just utilize. Okay. Okay. So where do we start? So this is the piece that stops many entrepreneurs from succeeding is just not even knowing where to start. And this can be in any area of your business. Um, for some of us, like it was for me, it was in the bookkeeping. Uh, I, like I just told you, I've been in business for, I'll just say decades, <laughs> and I never kept a good set of books until last year I finally got a, uh, a call him my financial ninja. Um, I got him in place and got in his program to get my button gear and do what I needed to do with my numbers. Now, not only do I have my numbers straight, but I can pass that on to you, everything that I've learned through that. Yes, I suck at bookkeeping too. Trust me. <laughs> but now I have these simple processes. It makes it really easy. And we're going to touch on that a little bit uh, today because you have to know your numbers. You have to have to have to know your numbers. Uh, so we're going to work on that. If that's a weakness, we're going to work on that. That may be a strength for you which is great, but maybe you're struggling with how to get started on the social media part or the marketing. We're going to help you with that. So, so everybody has a different place that they need to start. Um, so that was one of the things that we're going to go over in the Facebook group as well, so that we start with you and help you with where to, to start and what you need to do next, right? I don't want anybody to get stuck in overwhelm and too much to do. Okay, so as I said, we're going to use these webinar sessions to go over the steps that I'm creating for you. I'm going to do demos as needed. I'm going to answer questions, but the real digging in comes after we're done and you go to do the actual work and then we interact after that. Um, so you will not be left alone. And so please, please, please ask for help where needed and, um, we'll jump in. We will help you get unstuck. Okay. But we can only do that if you actually speak up. You probably think that all these things that you need to do in your business, everything feels important. Everything feels like it's a priority. And I'm going to give you permission right now to set things aside and focus on one thing at a time in growing your business. Because this is what I found. When I try to do too many things at once, they all kind of fall through the cracks. If I put on my blinders and focus on doing one thing and doing it well, it is much, much better. So I'm going to give you permission to just 
push some stuff over to the side. You don't have to do it all at once. Shiny object syndrome, yes, yes. Uh, that can also be known as brilliant idea syndrome as well. That That's one that I have trouble with. One of the ways to deal with that is write those things down. If you are pulled or distracted or something catches you, have a notebook or if you like to do things on the computer, have you know something open where you can write it down so that you're not just dismissing it, you're just setting it aside for now and you can always go back to it later, okay? We wanna work from where you are and then store some things in the vault for later, right? Because this is, this is a six-week course, but this is not just a six-week process. You will be working on this for months. And it will really, truly, in a business, it never ends. You're always implementing and using new things and learning new things because business changes. Things I mean, look at eBay, every, you know, every time we turn around, they're putting a new change. So you have to stay on top and be flexible and do those things. But, but really, when you put the systems in place, you'll be able to take each one of those and go through the same system and go, okay, here's what do we need to do next with this. Okay, good deal? Uh, you will have access to these session recordings and can always come back and review pieces you put aside. They will be put up over on the niche2success.com website on a special page that you will have access to, and any time you need to review, they're there for you. All right. Okay, this is, this is definitely one of my rules. There will be no overwhelm. And the reason I say that is, believe it or not, this is a comfort zone. It is an avoidance. It is a place our brain likes to go to give us an out from doing something that doesn't feel quite right. So, like I said, not only do you have me, but you have the mentors over in the group to ask questions, get clarification, work through things, get feedback moving forward, okay? Some of this will be hard for you, and some of it will be easy. So there's lots of pieces to this, and with everybody working together, there's going to be strengths and weaknesses, and, and if we work as a group, that's going to be very, very powerful. Um, for those of you who uh, were at the More Fun, Bigger Profits conference in 2015 or seen the recordings, I had a gentleman there by the name of Joe Kamikow. Joe Kamikow is, uh, he is a personal friend that was willing to come share that story, but I brought him in because he is one of the most successful people that I know. He's a multi-multi-millionaire. He uh, has a condo at the top of the Aria. For those of you who know Vegas, he's got like a penthouse there that he lives. He has a home in uh, Kentucky, and I believe he has one in New York as well. He has a collection of cars, including uh, an original uh, version of the Batmobile from the, okay, when was Batman, the original one? I wanted to say 1960s, is that right? Anyway, back then, <laughs> um, every time there's like some new version of some fancy car, he goes, he can just go buy it. I mean, it's, I, I like to call it stupid money. Um, but what he, I asked him, I said, Joe, what is the secret to your success? And he gave me an answer that, uh, and he actually gave me this answer when I went and had lunch with him before the conference. Um, and it was not what I was expecting. He said he learned something from his father. Seven words to use. I'm in trouble and I need help. He says those seven words are what caused him to be the success that he is. And I thought, wow, okay, we have to be willing, I'm just going to say it, we have to be willing to be stupid sometimes. Because I see sometimes people don't want to ask a question because they think it's a stupid question. People, there are no stupid questions. There are only questions that we don't know the answers to and somebody else does. That's it. It's as simple as that. Nobody knows everything. And there's experience levels, so don't ever feel stupid asking a question. I'm going to make that a rule. Um, if you get in trouble, 
ask for help because if somebody doesn't know you're in trouble, they can't help you, right? So everybody willing to, to give that little shout out and stay out of overwhelm? All right, got to make sure you guys are all paying attention here. Okay, just remember that overwhelm feeling is a comfort zone and we are not staying in comfort zones. Now it sounds kind of kind of counter whatever you want to call that. You guys know what I mean. Um, but it truly is. It's a comfort zone. It's a place we go to avoid doing what we know we need to do. All right. Now let's get into some work here. So you guys all have your business assessment worksheet. Um, so be sure you download, print it out, fill that out. This is the starting point. This is all this is. This is an assessment. This is not looking at it and going, oh my gosh, I'm so far behind, okay? Nobody's going to do that. Um, you are more than welcome to send them to me and have me store them, look over them. Um, I would love to know your beginning numbers, but it's not a requirement. I know some people are uncomfortable sharing numbers and things, but I would love to. I would love to work with you through this from the starting point and know exactly where you are in your business. So I'm going to do a quick check with you guys. I have a little poll that I'm going to run. And just real quick, um, it, there was nine check boxes for the marketing checklist. I would just like to know how many of those boxes you were able to check off and I just launched the poll you can answer that right there click right on your screen okay I'm going to close this poll so it looks like uh, most of you are in the three to six range uh, nobody has them all so actually that's good news that means we have a place to go for everybody uh, nobody did all of them and only, let's see, 6%, it depends how many people, let's see, da, 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 da. so that'd be, okay, so um, only one person has done seven to eight of them. Awesome, and I bet I know who that is. <laughs> Some of you are repeaters here. Um, good job, all right. Now, the other thing on your business assessment worksheet was the audience target. Now, this is where we get into niche. Dun, 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 dun. So let me just ask real quick, one more. Let's do one more little poll here. All right. This poll is for I know my niche, and there you can choose one of three. It's either yes and sticking with it, yes but want to change or add a new one, uh, or no, I haven't figured it out yet. And if you haven't figured it out yet, that's okay. We can figure that out. Now, what I find is a lot of times um, I talk to people and, and see a niche direction and then give a couple suggestions, but they're not willing to go in that direction. And that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before when I said uh, you have to be willing to take some risks. So. Picking a niche doesn't mean that that's the niche that you have to stick with forever. But if you don't have a direction, we want to get you going in a direction. So if you don't have that niche yet, that would be the first thing. That would be your starting point. That would be where we need to start. You need to have the niche. Wanting to expand the products within your niche is great, but that means you have a niche. So that's awesome. And yes, Alex, you have a niche. Many of you have a niche. Many of you have a niche and think you don't have a niche. <laughs> so um, let's see. Is everybody pretty much voted here? Yep. Okay. i um, going to close this poll in about five seconds. If you wanted to get your answer in real quick, I'm going to close that one. So 29% uh, so of you said yes and sticking with it. 47% said yes, but want to change or add a new, and 24% said no, I haven't figured it out yet. So I'm really uh, interested in the 47% of you um, in exploring more of why you want to change, and we can do that over on the Facebook group um, 
because it may not be that you need to change your niche. It may just be that you need to fine tune it. So we need to talk about that. That's a starting point for you is first, let's see what your niche is and, and talk about why you want to change it and go from there. Those of you, yes, and sticking with it, awesome. Then your place is not developing your niche. Your place is uh, looking at it and as like some of you said is what other products can you bring into it? How can you reorganize maybe some of your categories, that type of thing. Uh, those of you uh, who don't have it figured out yet, then that's the starting point. We're going to figure out your niche. Um, that will be the first thing that we have to do or none of the rest of it is going to come easy. Um, or you want to grow your niche. Excellent. I see that too. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right, so let's just talk about niche a little more um, because a lot of people think of niche as like a product, like, oh, you know, like the <laughs> I had an example until I went to think of it. Um, a lot of these things come onto your, your midnight infomercial stuff, you know. Um, so, y you know, if you sell skincare, let's say, um, a lot of people think of niche as like one particular line of like it's product centric. For me, that's not the case. For me, niche in the e-commerce world as I teach it is about a customer, a certain customer. So it isn't the products, it isn't the skincare line, it's the who is using it. So now you, yes, you can sell that skincare cream, but what else do they use? What else do those people buy? So that's really important. Niche can be described as a certain customer. And I and I like I like you to like pick out this person and and, and envision them and, and give them a face and a name and a hair color and, and color of eyes and an age and a and a profession and and really who is that target you are trying to reach with the products that you're selling. So it's not just about you selling clothing and shoes, but who is buying those clothing and shoes. So um, don't think of it as selling products. Think of it as selling things that a certain type of person wants to buy. And again, I go back to this example because it, it really is a, a good example. Um, and, I, and I'll do this for you guys. You're doing a home project. You're a you're a home you're a honey doer, <laughs> as I like to call it around here. You do honeydew projects on the weekend, and the weekend comes and you don't have the right piece of wood to finish the project. Where do you go? You go to Home Depot, or you go to Lowe's, or you go into Ace Hardware. You go to a hardware store. So when you go into that hardware store for that piece of wood. And you walk into that store, what is the likelihood that there's going to be something else in that store that catches your eye? Okay, okay, that was funny. Order it online and put the project off. <laughs> that, that would be my husband. <laughs> likelihood, 100%, okay. Yeah, because you're walking into a store that knows who you are. They know that when you come in for that piece of wood, you're going to like see something else on the shelf that makes you think of another project you have to do or another project that you want to do or um, maybe just something that looks cool like a new tool. You notice how they put the tools right up front in the store? You can't miss the tool section. That's because what guy doesn't want a nice new set of screwdrivers, you know, or whatever it is. They make it so enticing because you're the ideal customer. Now, those stores also have segmented ideal customers, and that's another way to expand your niche is look at how else your niche can appeal to another group. So in the case of Home Depot or Lowe's, not only do they have the, the, the weekend warrior doing the projects, they also have contractors. So they also cater to that. But I can tell you their marketing to the contractor is different than their marketing to the weekend warrior. 
Okay, so that's another way to expand your niche without having to change the products that you're selling. Um, an example for uh, for the ladies is let's use doo -doo -doo -doo. oh I know Hobby Lobby. You walk into a Hobby Lobby because you are looking for a particular crafting kit, right? So you go in for that crafting kit or some supply for that craft and an hour later you're coming out with all these cool things in your cart, right? Or the container store if you are into home organizing. Those are examples of, of niche stores that are not limited in what they're offering to the customers. There is a huge amount of project, products that you can sell to every niche. What you need to do is define who the customer is and then look for the products that meet that customer's needs. Are we good on that? You guys get what niche actually is? Or I should say, I think most of you do. So is there anybody who's still confused about niche? So I want to make sure you really understand this because this is the foundation. Yeah, okay, Dollar Tree. Let's look at Dollar Tree. That is a niche store. Who are they catering to? Who is Dollar Tree catering to? Not a wealthy person. <laughs> Cheapskates, frugal, people who like to save money. So who is the person that likes to save money? Who could that person be? They could be low income. See, some of you coming up with like low income, homeless. Some of you are saying me. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're places to save money. They're, you're not brand conscious. You are probably a very, very hardworking person with a family. Uh, you're trying to make ends meet. You're bargain shoppers. Exactly. That's, that is the niche. That is the niche. Now, and I'm glad you said that, Lisa, do they get customers that are not in that niche? Absolutely. See, that's the beauty of a niche. It doesn't make it so that nobody else outside of that niche will shop with you. It just makes it really, really easy for you to harvest and market to that certain customer. It doesn't limit you from selling to the other customers. They'll still find you. They'll still buy stuff. They just won't probably be your raving fans. Okay, so let's take a look at the competition. Once you discover your niche and you're looking at it, so we're going to do this a little different than you normally hear me do because in the Niche to Profit Academy, when I say look at your competition, I'm saying look at how they lay things out, the keywords they're using, and sort of use that as a guide to build your business. That's the first step. Now, more advanced, I want you to look at what they're not doing. What gaps are they not filling? How can you be different? See, now this is where you really start getting an edge. Look for the ways they aren't serving the customer's needs and see how you can fill that gap. So it's not just what you are seeing, but what you are not seeing when you look at the competition. And when I say look at the competition, um, look at the, the category of products that you're selling in. So if you sell in clothing or shoes, you know, pick a company that resembles the types of clothing that you're selling and catering to that market you want to sell to. Um, so it may be the preppy crowd. It may be the designer crowd. It may be the plus side crowd. So find the big name store that caters to that market and really study what they're doing so that you can, yes, do the things that make sense to do that are smart. Um, SEO moves in that, but also look at how you can be better. And yes, you can be better than a big name brand. And you can be better because you are way more flexible being uh, a small business. They have to go through committees and legal and agitate over everything and get market research. You don't have to do all that. You can see things that need to be done and just make decisions and take some risks. Yep. Oh, that's a great idea, Paula. Every time I come across a store I like, I put it in a file. It really helps me. That is a fantastic idea. Thank you for sharing that. 
can you sell upscale men's clothes along with Western men's clothes? Uh, that is going to depend on the customer you're trying to reach. So I would say if men's clothes, upscale men's clothes, is the products you want to carry, look at who the potential niche market is. Look at who the potential customer is and see if those two customers are the same for those products. Um, if they're not, they can be sold under the same brand, but you'll want to develop one line of customers and then use what you learned from that, kind of rinse and repeat to develop another line of customers and another line of customers and so on and so on. Uh, if you try to scatter it too much, you'll get overwhelmed with how much work there is to do trying to get those customers. So being different out there in the market is not just following what the competition is doing, it is getting that little edge that's going to set you apart, make you unique, and uh, make you the golden egg in the, in the nest, so to speak. And that's really what we're going to do over the next six weeks, is we're going to really work on what that is, defining it, and, and building from it. So don't worry if it isn't all coming to you right now. This is what this is all about. This is a process. It's not all going to happen today. I'm setting the groundwork for you guys to know what's coming and what you need, to, how you need to be thinking as you're now looking out there and you're going sourcing and all these things. Uh, how can you be the next big brand? And, and who wants to be the next big brand? Who would love to be in those stories of, you know, like I told about Starbucks and Ralph Lauren? Yeah. All right, and do you believe that's possible? Awesome, awesome, because I believe it's possible. Any single person in this webinar right now can be that next big brand. You can, yep. That's okay if it's a small scared hand up as long as it's up. All right, <laughs> that's right. Anybody, I, I'm seriously, this isn't anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. Right? Okay. This is where most business owners get in trouble. It is not the slow sales. It is the lack of cash flow and planning. So this is definitely a part of the system that we have to put in place. To know if what you're doing is working, you must know where you're starting from. Guessing is not something business owners do when it comes to the numbers. None of those billionaires guessed about what was going on as they grew their business. Okay, so remember this. Uh, if you're talking to your piggy bank and wondering where the money went, that's not a good thing. Um, so we're going to work on that as one of the first thing, and that is in the business assessment worksheet you got. You'll see I talk about cash flow in there. It is basically the total amount of money being transferred into and out of your business especially as affecting liquidity, and liquidity is the cash that you have to use. That's the cash you use to pay the bills, to buy new inventory, and all of that. So it's super important to get a handle on that. And on the worksheet, you will see there was a place to list all of your expenses. Now, we can go one step further with this. Um, because I, I gave a very simple version. I want to show you if I can, there we go, I gotta find, a, when I'm doing this, it hides my screen, you guys. It hides my, my browser is what I mean to say. I gotta go find it so I can show you. I'm first gonna show you. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Um, I'm, this is my inventory sheet. I am, I, I did not have an inventory management system in place for 18 years of doing my business. I never even knew how much inventory I had. What I had, it was a mess, but yet I still managed to do okay. Uh, but now I've put systems in place where I can bring in somebody else to work for me and help me list. So. This is my actual inventory spreadsheet that I work from. You can see I have um, lots of tabs on the bottom for all the different things. Basically, something comes in. I put the date purchased, the date listed, what it, I, I put the titles here, quantity, cost, blah, 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 blah. And then on my sold sheet, 
my sold tab, now I can keep track of all the things that I've got going here, right? So what I've done for you guys is I have made you a blank sheet. And I will share this with all of you. So if you want to use this, in fact, just let me know over in the Facebook group if you would like to use this. Um, it's got the formulas already built in. And I just put eBay, Etsy, Amazon, and sold at the bottom for you. Um, but you put your buy date, your list date, what it is, and what it costs you, and just keep track. And that way you also have a running total of how much you have invested in your inventory. This is important. Okay, uh, so I will share that with you. This is also my financial sheet. And this is uh, something, now I combine both personal and business expenses on the sheet because they work together. So a lot of you are working your business to pay your personal expenses. So you need to know what those expenses are too. You need to know how much you need to bring in every month. So I have developed this, and you can just take out, um, I'll share this with you, you can take out my numbers and put in your own, but these are my, this is debt on this first. These are all the things I need to pay. We use the Dave Ramsey uh, baby steps, where we snowball the payments, and uh, basically you take your lowest, uh, I, this changed, this used to be lower, um, you take your lowest balances and pay those first, not the highest entrance, you pay the lowest balances. Because you get the snowball effect and you can see over here that once something is paid off, now you roll those amounts that you were paying into the next one and get that paid off and then into the next one and you get that paid off. And pretty soon everything is paid off. So uh, I will share that with you as well. Then I have an income sheet. So all of your different streams of income, and we'll talk about revenue in a second, you put those, and I separate out business and personal, business and personal, and keep a rolling tab of that. So I will share this with you as well. On here I have a tab for business expenses, and the reason I have a last update is if you have things like postage, those are changing all through the month. So if you want to work on this once a week or once every couple of days, you just put here the last date that you updated this and added those fees in to keep a running total. And then personal. Getting all of these numbers in place is really going to help you see what not only you need to do in your business, but how you will know when you get to the point that you want to be at where this isn't an issue anymore of that whole like living to pay the bills. I hate living to pay the bills. Don't want to do that. And I will tell you, if you don't have this stuff in order, it doesn't matter what level you will get to, you'll be broke. <laughs> We're all broke at a different level. So it's really important to get a handle on these numbers. And I've been doing this now for about nine months, and we've paid off numerous bills. And actually, we, for the first time in our 20, almost 21 years of marriage, have a savings. We have an emergency fund. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So really important stuff. So let me put the PowerPoint back up here. So your expenses are everything to do with your business. So that's everything you buy to sell, your postage, your shipping supplies, office expenses, VAs, employees, education, Niche to Profit Academy, if you're in that, that is an education expense, tools, subscriptions, selling channel fees, anything else, break them all out so you can see where your money's going and know where you can cut money. What's a savings? <laughs> ah, yeah, that's another thing. You should be putting some money aside out of every sale. You've heard me preach on that one before, too. All right, so um, I showed you those sheets. Anybody who wants those, just let me know over on the Facebook group. I'm happy to share those. Once I share it, make a copy for yourself so um, not everybody is seeing your information. Then it'll be yours privately. Yep. Okay. Uh, revenue. Where does your money come in from? So if you are just on eBay, that's, that's a channel. That's where your money comes from. Some of you are on eBay, Etsy, Amazon, your own site. All of those things, you need to break them out individually so that you can track 
if they're worth your time and expense to keep them going. I'm actually finding that Etsy is just not giving me the return that I want. I may be closing Etsy. I do get sales there. I get sales there, but because I can track exactly what's happening there, it's it's just not worth my while to put the time into it. Yeah, so some of you have do consulting and coaching or uh, you give classes, book sales, have you written a book? Those are all income streams. Affiliate commissions, those can be a really, really good income stream. On the time, uh, good question, the, the time period. So we like to look at everything from a business perspective for a year. So because you want your year over year uh, expenses to hopefully go down percentage wise to your profits. So um, I'd like to say look at 2015, look at 2016 year to date, and then at the end of 2016 you can match. But you need to know on a month to month basis too what you're doing. So I actually look at mine monthly. I have a profit and loss sheet. I do keep QuickBooks on top of those sheets that I showed you. And I have a bookkeeper who I call my money translator. Um, now my bookkeeper is about 350 bucks a month. That is because I have about six different things going that she has to keep track of. So most of them, a good bookkeeper is gonna cost you uh, 50 to 60 dollars per hour and then it depends on how much time they have to put into keeping your books but if you're not good at numbers that that is an investment that will be invaluable uh, because they truly are your money translator and can show you where money is getting wasted where you could be making more, where things kind of fell apart, and where things are going really good. Because when things are going really good in an area of your business, you want to do more of them. Yep. ASP, we talked about this already a little bit in the Facebook group, your average selling price. This is another area that you can increase your profits uh, without increasing the number of items that you list. Because if there's only one of you and there's only so many hours in the day and you can't get more listed, this is a way you can increase your revenue. So that's something I want you to be looking at too because it all comes down to profit margin, which is your revenue minus your expenses equals profits. Where's my little plus? There we go, <laughs> or my equals profits. Oops, um, and that's what it's all about, you guys, is increasing the profit. So even if your expenses increase, as long as your revenue is expanding more than your expenses and your profits are growing, that is growing your business, okay? I don't wanna go too heavy into this because this is really something that you need to sit down and work through and we need to talk about um, if need be over in the Facebook group, right? Also, if you are in the Niche to Profit Academy, we just did a whole webinar on this. So the ways to increase your profits, are, again, is either increase sales, decrease expenses, or increase your average selling price. I want you to be looking at last year's sales expenses and profit. Look at this year's year-to-date sales expenses and profits, okay? But here's the fun part. This is the part I want you to really give some thought to. Your desired increase. Now, you can put a percentage here or you can make it a number, whatever feels better for you, but know how much more you wanna do than you're doing right now. Because here's the way we're looking at it. You need to know where you've been, see the road that you're on, Look at the map so that you can change directions, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk a lot more about strategy on getting those increases, and that's gonna be different for each one of you. It's gonna depend on where you are in your business. That's why we're not gonna go too heavy into that here in the webinar format, um, because really it's an individual thing, and just let me know if you need help with that, and we will go for it. The other thing, is really important, and it's on those business assessment worksheets, is, let me just make sure, yes, it's on there, 
a three-year goal, a five-year goal. Where do you want to be in three years and where do you want to be in five years? Because if you can figure out what those numbers are, you can build a strategy to get there. And that's why I said, if you don't want to be a billionaire, there is no shame in that. Put the number you want to be at. Uh, my three-year goal is a million dollars and my five-year goal is to be at five million dollars. Those are my two. And I really, really want you guys to dare to dream. I mean, obviously, you know how much you are willing to work at whatever your goal is. You know what number is going to make sense. So I don't want you to put some pie in the sky number unless you're truly ready to dig in and go for that number, okay? So I'm with you. Whatever you're willing to do, I'm right here behind you, give you the push, give you the strategies, help you figure out what that means, but you've got to do the work. So really you have to decide what number makes sense. You want to have your house paid off. So you know what that number is, right? So you not only need to make that much above and beyond your expenses and whatever else you are using the money for that, that comes in, you have to determine what that amount is you need to set for that fund. Ah. Okay, so you guys ready for your homework for the week? You need to complete the business assessment worksheet if you haven't already. If you want to share those with me, uh, you can do so uh, in email. I will give you guys a special email. How's that? VIP at thedannyapp.com. Now, right? All right, so decide on a niche if you haven't done that already. And again, if this is where you're struggling, this is where we start. That's your first step that you're going to forget about anything else. You're going to do that. Um, if you've already got your niche but you don't have your financial stuff in place, then that is going to be the place you're going to start, okay? So check out the competition. As I said, I love the idea of, of making a file for those stores that really resonate with you, that feel like kind of the direction that you're going with your niche. Uh, so save those. Check them out. Check out what they're doing and find those gaps. And set your three- and five-year goals, guys. It's going to be fun. I See, I love that attitude. The attitude that this is going to be fun, that this is exciting, already, you're a rock star. You're a rock star. Love that. We are going to wrap it up. If you come up with something, as soon as I hit the end button, you know where to find me over in the Facebook group. And let's get this party started. Let's get these businesses rocking and rolling, yes, and start doing the work. All right, guys. And with that, go be profitable and make it fun. Thanks, everyone.